Good afternoon and welcome to the ABSA Business Day Supplier Development Awards uh, Dialogue Series. Today I'm really delighted to have uh, three fabulous guests. Uh, we're in a little bit of a celebration mood uh, because we have today two of the finalists for the 2020 awards. And, uh, and we're speaking about resilience. So we're speaking about nation building and how is it that we can support uh, entrepreneurs and businesses generally to be resilient in these, uh, in these really tricky times. So as you know, the, the awards are brought to you in partnership with Cold Press Media, Business Day and Fotola. And we're really here in order to unlock the potential of the country, particularly using this vehicle of supplier development. So I'd like, first of all, to speak to Kuni Slabat. So Kuni uh, is uh, from CEDA, the Small Enterprise Development Agency, and they're in fact sponsors of the Small Business Award for this year and sponsors of this particular dialogue. So Kuni is, uh, is a longtime um, a part, a, a long -time employee at, at CEDA, and I was delighted to know today that he's also a process uh, re-engineer. And I know as a business practitioner myself, they are really important in the, in the process of turning businesses into being really globally competitive. So I'm delighted to have you on board, uh, Kuni. Kuni, uh, from some, uh, CEDA's perspective, this is quite a tricky time, um, you know, this whole kind of COVID uh, pandemic that's hit us. And it's all about resilience. What is it that CEDA is doing in, in the environment that's maybe particularly pertinent? To, to the times that we, we're experiencing at the moment. Uh, thanks, thanks, uh, Kathy. Um, CEDA is currently, as you know, that uh, the government has taken on um, it, it, processes of how we can rebuild the economy. I, I wouldn't like to say after COVID because, uh, you know, really, will we have an after COVID or how do we have to live with COVID as the new norm? You know, so um, we've got a number of programs that we are currently looking at to ensure at the end of the day that we will be at least be able to sustain businesses, uh, you know, uh, as they go through this process. We, we are now looking at a, a recovery. So with the recovery processes that we are implementing, there's a number of things that we are doing. We are looking at localization. Now, localization is going to be very, very important for this country. Uh, why? Because uh, when we go into um, the new processes, you realize that all countries in the world are going to be concentrating on their own economies. So for us as South Africa, we need to concentrate on our own economy and make sure that everything is manufactured here and the emphasis, you know, is going around manufacturing. We need to start focusing on manufacturing. And when we, manu we do the manufacturing processes, we also look at how we are going to uh, deal with uh, businesses that are going through a rough patch. We have what we call a program that we call business viability. Now, this business viability is going to be looking at those businesses that are really going through a rough time, but that are not yet at a rescue process. You know, they're, they're just a little bit ahead of the rescue processes. So with the business viability, we look at uh, the, the business's cash flow, uh, you know, how the business is doing, how they manage their uh, cash flow, or let me say their liquidity. And then we start implementing processes in that regard to ensure that these businesses will then have the necessary uh, kick to, to help them to sustain themselves, but also to, you know, to navigate through the, 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 uh, the pandemic, but also to look at growing further. And uh, when we look at manufacturing, we, we are bringing in a number of pro programs that will deal with manufacturing. So we, we have, we're encouraging a number of pro uh, 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 manufacturers, but also we're looking at the informal sector. How are we going to assist government in growing uh, the GDP? We are looking at this by bringing in, you know, uh, uh, those informal businesses, try and bring them in so that they become formal businesses. They can contribute towards the fiscus. If they contribute towards the fiscus, obviously a number of things will start changing in the country. Uh, when we have more money coming in, there's uh, more money circulating in the economy. Disposable income for families is getting better. You know, uh, we then help the country by getting rid of a number of grants, but also creating more job opportunities. So in that regard, we believe that uh, we are starting to gear ourselves to deal with the after effects of this pandemic as we know it, so that uh, the economy will be able to, to, to grow and we can then 
uh, focus on the things that matter most, and that's to creating the new job opportunities that might be available. But we're also focusing on uh, how uh, the 4IR is going to be uh, uh, implemented or, or taken up in South Africa. We know that you know all over the world, people start to looking at technology. We are always lagging behind. But with this process, we are saying now that we don't want to lag behind in, in, in technology. We want to be found, find ourselves as part of the uh, role players up front that will help you know um, bringing in the youth as 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 they graduate from uh, Tibet colleges from universities you know and they, they they leave school and so on and so on so that there at least there's a future where they can start focusing on and dealing with uh, jo- starting to set up their own businesses so that ultimately they will then start to create jobs and I think when we start looking at these things we will then help uh, to deal with these issues that we are currently faced with and eventually ensure that the economy will go in the right direction. Perfect. Thanks so much, Kuni. And I know that CEDA is working very hard themselves on on a strategy, you know, uh, kind of rethinking your own strategy in order to make sure that you're really on the button and doing what's needed in the country. So, so yeah, so you you as an organization are also really turning on the screws for yourselves. and, And I think that's really laudable. So well done for that. Um, let's go now to Noni uh, Kobishiana. Uh, Noni um, is the, uh, let me just get this right. Um, you are the business development specialist at SA, SAB. Um, and Noni, I'm so delighted that, you, that you're that you here. Um, but won't you just speak a little bit about this whole concept of survivalist? Because I know as SA, SA breweries, you've come through a really difficult time as a big business. You know, the whole alcohol ban really hit you. Um, and how, how has that translated uh, your own survival and, and how are you managing this whole thing of like helping small businesses to survive and, and be resilient in these times? Um, thank you, Catherine. Um, I think COVID-19 has highlighted the vulnerability of our country's reliance on global supply chains. Um, it has shown us that we need to strengthen as well as grow our local manufacturing base as a springboard for export. Um, so SAB has been very dim, um, very committed in terms of focusing on transformation, localization, as well as developing small businesses within our direct value chain. Now, this is evident uh, with regards to the businesses that we support um, in all levels of development, starting from the agri side, where we support emerging farmers, we move to supply development, where we maintain 97% local ratio to distribution and sales, where we support retailers, as well as um, targeting social entrepreneurs. Um, But what we need, what we've identified is that we need to intensify um, national focus when it comes to localization, um, because we need to have supply chain inclusiveness. Especially now, we've heard that um, number of people without work in South Africa is going to increase to an additional 1 million people. I mean, this will place a high burden on the economy as well um, as the state, because then we have to support people without income. So we've heard um, numerous calls for localization in South Africa. I mean, the job summit is mentioning that we need to focus on, on localization, even the economy recovery plan. But we need to now move to a level of implementation. Right. What happens after the policies have been developed? Um, corporates need to also come to play and make commitments. So I think um, COVID-19 has impacted SAP negatively, but we've come up stronger. Um, we've also identified that we need to strengthen our supply chains as well um, and look at localization. We need to get to a level of 100% um, local content in South Africa. That would be great for us. Now we're at 97%. So our goal now is basically to focus on localization, to, to try and partner with corporates that um, have the same voice as us, um, having the same intentions to actually start buying local, start focusing on companies that are manufacturing local. Similar to what Kuni was mentioning further, I think this next um, wave should be focusing specifically on going back to basics, going back to our local companies and reviving um, and retaining jobs and creating new jobs and focusing on creating the next cohort of black industrialists. Lovely. Thanks so much, Noni. Um, I'm going to come back later to this concept that you spoke about, this kind of extended value chain. I really like that. Um, And maybe next time in the next round, I'd like to maybe just speak a little bit more to that, because I think often people just think that supply development is that business and the company. Mm -hmm. And for you to kind of explain how it's really it's it's a network 
more than a, a, and a single one-way um, uh, relationship. So maybe we'll speak about that a bit later. Thank you so much. Definitely. Next, I'd like to, to move to Charles, Charles Wyeth from Distel. So Charles is, he, I'm going to get this right, I'm stumbling a lot today, I don't know what it is, I obviously <laughs> didn't, uh, didn't eat my cornflakes this morning. Um, a local <laughs> economic development management in Distel. So, so Charles, you're well known in the industry, um, you've got a, a really long background, uh, both from CSIR and in other, uh, other similar positions, and I know that you're really passionate about the work that you do. Do you want to tell me a little bit um, about what it is that you've been doing in Distel and, and how has your strategy changed over the uh, over the last three years, what's important to you in Distel uh, in, in supply development? Thanks, Catherine. I think one of the things that Distel has realized is that as one of the largest players in the South African alcoholic beverages manufacturing sector, we're aware that our business decisions impact the lives of a large number of companies and the people who work in those companies, not just um, within South Africa, but actually beyond our borders as well. And we're very conscious of using our assets and expertise, um, whether it's our manufacturing infrastructure or our buying power or the knowledge of our staff, their skills and their expertise, essentially to develop the resilience of companies to withstand the many challenges and external shocks, like the alcohol ban, for example, um, that the whole industry has to endure uh, from time to time. So we're very committed to building the capacity of our suppliers, more specifically our ESD beneficiaries to withstand those external shocks, as well as the internal changes that they need to implement to improve efficiencies and profitability in the short term. So we do this through the provision of three types of support. First one, access to markets. The most important thing for all small businesses, in, for all businesses, and small business in particular. And that's where we open our supply chain and constantly look for opportunities where we say, how can we get more businesses and more smaller businesses in particular to access not just the cell siphon supply chain, but the broader group within the Remgro um, family of companies and also our partner mm -hmm. companies as well. And then we look at access to finance as the second area. And then we have two types of instruments the short term, let's call it bridging finance and longer term um, loans, all at zero interest. And then the provision of general business development support services. So our strategy is really to transform every element of our supply chain, particularly in the highly skewed farming sector where the level of black ownership is extremely poor. Um, and there we, we're working with government and other stakeholders to create opportunities for sustainable and long-term land ownership and more opportunity creation. And coming to the last part of your question around change of strategy, initially it was very much a reactive uh, approach to enterprise development that we had. And then over the past two years in particular, it's becoming a lot more focused a lot more targeted at the specific needs of the individual ESD beneficiaries that we have. And there we work with the company owners as well as any other partners we may have that directly imp impact those particular um, ESD beneficiaries to say, what is the right pool of services and support that that particular company or beneficiary needs at that moment in time? because in that way we can direct the right kind of support to a company when it needs it most. Mm, thanks, thanks, Charles. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I mean, the, the kind of thought that really come, pops to the fore um, while you're speaking is this incredible sense of responsibility. Um, you know, that there is this real responsibility for one supply chain. And particularly in, in your case in agriculture, both you and SAB, it's that um, there's a long term, you can't just turn on or off a farmer, you know, um, you know, you know, it, it's that's, it's, you know, it's just not like that. You can't say, sorry, buddy, I'm not going to buy grapes from you this year, or sorry, I'm not going to buy your barley, um, then they're not going to be there next year. And so, I mean, I really Correct. get this sense of responsibility. And as you were saying, this, it's really this kind of network. So, so all of the different elements that go into supporting a supply chain, selecting the right people, making sure that you look after them in the long, in the long, in the long term. Yeah, it's, it's, some, it's, 
it's no easy task. Not at all. No. <laughs> so yeah, maybe just going to you, uh, Kuni. I mean, what's really come out from the conversation, is, and, and I know it's something that is dear to you as well, is the sense that really it's an ecosystem. Um, you know, knowing and, and what is it that, what is the role that maybe CEDA plays in, in fostering, you know, in fostering good ecosystem or, you know, or, and, and really kind of pinning, pinning, um, underpinning the whole uh, small business uh, growth in, in, in South Africa. Your, your mic is, your mic. Oh, I beg your pardon. Um, Partnership and, and relationship building for us is very, very important. Um, we are in the, in, in the process now of driving uh, an ecosystem a facilitation process throughout the country where we uh, want to facilitate all bus small business related uh, uh, initiatives and activities. And we can only do this through a very strong partnership in, in, in the industry. So uh, we've started now, we, we, we've done a lot of hard work in mapping the ecosystem to understand who are the role players in the country in all business uh, sectors and environments. We are also uh, working hand in hand with all uh, government departments. Uh, as we speak, yesterday we had a, a meeting with, with uh, COCTA and uh, various municipalities throughout the country wherein we are saying, this is what we do as a business development service provider. Now, we want to work hand in hand with all uh, other role players within the ecosystem so that we can assist each other in developing the much needed uh, services and also share the very scarce resources that are available in the industry. And as you know, uh, government is in a drive of, 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 of reducing costs uh, because money is getting lesser and lesser in, 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 in circulation. So in order to assist with that, we want to bring in all other partners and role players to assist us in delivering this. But um, while we are doing the, that, we uh, want to go ahead and say, within all the client journey processes that we have, because when we, we, we work with clients or we deal with clients, we understand that there is a journey that we have to undertake with our clients. It's not just something that we consult with the client once and it's, it's over and done. It's a whole process. It's a journey. And this journey takes a number of, of, of years to, you know, to perfect and to, to ensure that everything else is in place. Now, in order for us to do this, we, we, we are uh, looking at facilitating this process, but also creating uh, touch points where we understand what each role player will be doing and how we can facilitate this process so that everything does not just depend on CEDA or on, or on, the, on, 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 on uh, the municipalities or on the private sector, but we each one of us have a very distinct role that we can play so that we support each other and not repeat what the other entity or, uh, uh, is doing when we assist clients. For example, if we deal with, with a client that supplies uh, Distel with, with, with whatever product they supply Distel with, you know, our role will be to say uh, to, to the client, this is what we can do for you. And Distel will then say to us, look, this is what we want. So those clients that you are bringing to us to, to, uh, to help us or even SAB, um, those clients that you bring to us, they have to meet these criteria. And we have to facilitate that process within the environment to say, we have SABS here, we have this entity here, we have, this, we have the universities, we have the service providers and so on and so on that will assist us in delivering all the business development services within this ecosystem. So our role within this ecosystem is to ensure sure that we gather all the role players to understand each and everyone's responsibility so that we can then form this process to be flawless, but to support each and everyone every step of the way to ensure that at the end of the day, we have growing, sustainable businesses, uh, small businesses, but also within uh, big business that are there, they will be able to know that the supply that they get from, uh, from their small suppliers, those uh, supplies are of the right quality, of the right standard, and they will be delivered on time. Nice, you know, thank you. Thank, nothing thanks. as serious as delivering late, you know, to a, to a customer. Thank you, Kuni. Yeah, I think you, with your, your corporates will definitely 
the big smiles there. They all they all sit me on that. I mean, the one, yeah, reliability of supply. I think that can be a whole discussion on its own. Thanks, Kuni. I mean, I think that what you're saying is again the sense of sense of shared responsibility, but that also, it's also a journey. Uh, so I'd like Noni, just if I can go back to you, really, to pick up on that. So you would just explain very briefly about the kind of journey or supplier journey. I don't know if you want to share a little bit more about that, uh, or, or really to and just to just to really speak a little bit more about this the sense of uh, localization and what it is that you're doing. I think um, I think it's very interesting the work that SAB is doing. Okay, no, thank you, Catherine. Um, so like I've mentioned in my earlier slot that um, we have applied a value chain transformation approach um, whereby we target um, the guys that are coming in from the raw material space um, agri-development program um, that supports emerging farmers to provide them with your technical support, your funding, as well as with markets, um, and assist them in, in, the, in, the, in the process of actually becoming commercial farmers. Um, but our main, I think, focus specifically is along the, the lines of supplier development um, that cuts across several industries. I mean, with supplier development, we ensure that we develop local supplies and we maintain that 97% local procurement ratio that I mentioned earlier. And with the distribution element as well, we've got suppliers that are coming in the distribution space, they are in our program and we assist them with process engineers to show that how can they become um, competitive in the industry. You know, as a small business, you always need um, an edge when you are competing with medium sized enterprises. So our program actually is very targeted. It takes a business um, into the space of introducing them to how to improve their business, um, aligns them with processes. Um, it also provides them with technical support that they would require as well to be competitive. Um, and the sales element that we've incorporated now is a program that targets um, retailers. I mean, our retailers are an important and critical element of our value chain, specifically now with COVID times, um, we've realized that they were not operating for like four, three months, three months. And those businesses have been hampered negatively. Um, we have focused on, in terms of providing them with support, um, looking at how can they um, provide your drinking responsible approaches to their customers as well. Specifically now, we've been told by the president that we all have to be responsible, right? Um, and now retailers are very important to us. We're showing the measures in terms of how to create additional streams, um, diversifying their offerings, looking at perhaps um, owning a spaza shop on the side um, and not relying solely on, on, on becoming an outlet that sells um, alcohol. So we are looking at several approaches to make sure that businesses in the different stages of our value chain are becoming independent. They are identifying opportunities to diversify their offerings. Um, and then finally, communities as well. Um, Communities and social entrepreneurship is a is an area that is of high importance to SAP. We have social entrepreneurs and social innovators that are coming up with incredible innovations that are changing the way that we are thinking, specifically now under COVID times, because you'd find that um, they are coming up with new ideas, new approaches. Um, because COVID is going to be here for eighteen months plus, right? That's what scientists are saying. Scientists are saying, don't wait for a vaccine. You need to adjust and re-engineer your business now. So a lot of approaches are coming from the social innovation program and we really are excited to find out what new innovations that they're coming up with and how will those impact on the broader business as a whole. Lovely, thanks Nani. That's, so, that's music to my ears, I love it. Um, when a big business, a global business such as yours uh, can really see the value that small the small guys bring because it's often the agility and the innovation of those guys that can really change a system. So yeah, I love the work that you're doing. Uh, well done. It's it's fabulous. Maybe just taking that forward uh, to you, Charles. Socially inclusive, social inclusivity. Uh, you mentioned in in the uh, earlier the importance of um, including. Uh, previously disadvantaged groups in, in farming. I mean, it's really, you know, the farming sector is probably one of the most difficult to transform. Do you want to share, tell us a little bit more about how you're managing to leverage some of your assets in order to um, enable this, uh, these opportunities? Certainly, thanks, Catherine. Um, within the farming sector specifically, this is where a huge opportunity has arisen, um, particularly for distal. Um, each year, Distel imports millions of litres of ap apple concentrate 
which we use in the production of our delicious savanna and hunter ciders. Um, and what's happened is we've launched a major initiative over the last few years to really go and identify what the specific challenges are that are contributing to keeping the status quo as it is with regard to low levels of black land ownership and low levels of black participation within the farming sector, particularly where markets have been identified. So in that regard, we've been working with a number of corporates um, and other service providers to um, work at mobilizing funding in particular. The Stalitz, and I must confess, working with funding institutions, commercial banks, and the DFIs is not an easy task. <laughs> um, over the past few years, over the past three years, we've mobilized just over just under 40 million rand for a few farms that we've been assisting to increase orchard production where apples can be grown. So we work with the international marketeers as well so that um, we can gain access to markets for them for the, let's call it the ap fresh apples for export markets. And then also the, the, the item that we need, which is the juice grade apples, which is ultimately converted into apple juice concentrate. So it's really a case of saying, what are the challenges that the farmers um, experience that is preventing more of them from coming into the market and what is preventing more of them, particularly those who have access to land from expanding their orchards. So our initiative has, um, as I said, we've worked with the financial institutions and um, we have mobilized at the moment, it's nearly in the order of a hundred million rand that's been provided um, for cash flow support for um, a lot of the um, startup, well, I shouldn't say startup, or a lot of the um, black owned businesses, because that's one of the biggest challenges that the business have. It's access to cash flow or for production capital during that long period that you've referred to early on, whilst the grapes are on the trees or whilst the apples are on the trees and not yet at a fruit bearing stage. That's when you need patient capital. And that's one of the areas where we have intervened in particular to assist companies, um, to assist farmers in that regard. But beyond that component as well, it's also been looking at how can we leverage the support of some of our partner organizations to give access to alternative um, products or crops. So for example, in the grape industry at the moment, it's extremely difficult to, to farm with grapes for wine when there's already a surplus and the price has decreased significantly. So we're looking at mixed cropping and food ca and cash cropping and that sort of alternatives and to get um, the right kind of resources mobilized to get um, additional streams of income mobilized for farmers in that particular space. And then just very quickly, um, another area like um, Nono has, Noni has referred to earlier on, and Kuni, um, has been around import replacement, um, product substitution, and localization that we're looking at is to say where there are manufacturing or products that is in, being imported into the country, how can we assist, assist um, our suppliers to start producing those locally? This is becoming yep. increasingly a focus of ours, um, especially in the last year now, which is exactly as Noni has been saying, that um, the pressure is going to be on all of us to say, how can we increase the amount of businesses that our local companies and our local suppliers can be doing and generating for the economy? Because those jobs are then local. And if we're there as buyers, it makes them more sustainable. Yeah, lovely. Thanks, Charles. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, I mean, I think that the nice thing about a crisis is that it forces you to think differently. And there's always a gift in it. And, and maybe what it is, is this, this really severe shakeup to, uh, to the economy is just what we need in order to push forward with different strategies. And one of those strategies that obviously um, it's one thing on the one side, we need to get the economy moving, we need to get jobs, jobs moving, um, but we also need to we need to balance uh, some of the some of the traditional kind of wealth challenges. You know, we have one of the worst uh, Gini coefficients 
in the world, meaning that we have the very, the very rich and the very poor. Um, and one of the areas that I know is a focus, in fact, of all, um, of a number of organizations, and there's a question that's come in, uh, Nani, it's addressed to you. Um, it's asking what programs do you have in place to engage with businesses in the townships? And in fact, what I'd like to do is um, maybe just, if you just want to respond to that, but I might just roll that question around to the other guys as well. So is there a particular focus, maybe not just on townships, but is there a particular focus on, uh, on kind of changing the balance of, uh, of wealth? And maybe the other question is, is supply development the, the route to do that? So first to you, Noni, uh, what programs do you have in the townships and, and, and do you believe that this is really a critical part of uh, supply development? Thank you, Catherine. Um, yes, definitely. Um, township economies are very important to SAB. We have a program that targets your retailers, the RDP program, um, basically providing retailers with skills, We're looking at um, responsible sourcing, um, how to diversify their offerings, looking at bookkeeping as well. So these are retailers that are within our um, books currently, retailers that need assistance with how to manage their businesses better. And majority of these businesses are actually women-owned businesses. And what we've realized is that with a woman-owned business, they tend to employ um, more employees and, and there's also a replica effect as well when it comes to assisting people within the community as well. Um, so this, it's, it's relatively new. It's like less than two years old. Um, and we're looking at branching it out with to different provinces as well. So this program works um, together with, with other partners. We've partnered with um, social partners as well as with government as well to show us how what is the best way in us to assist these businesses? And specifically now with COVID times, it's intensified our response to look at diversification of streams. Um, we never know whether the situation will return back next year again. I mean, we need to identify where are the opportunities for businesses to, have, to diversify, specifically those businesses within the township areas. I mean, there is a retailer currently that has been rolling out um, a specific um, distribution model. I don't want to mention it by name here, but um, that's, that's the type of model we're looking at currently. How can we scale up businesses within the township, right? And looking at um, growing them to, to become big enterprises and not just focusing on businesses that are in the urban areas. So that is a key focus for us as SAB. Um, we also have um, a farmer program that targets your, your rural as well as township areas as well, specifically youth owned, um, that has nine farmers that have been um, assisted, specifically youth owned farmers, um, cutting across the nine provinces. And those farmers are actually showing us that, I mean, farming does not have to be seen as an old age um, industry. Farm Farmers are young, they are women owned and youth owned, and they are actually providing um, changing the landscape as well. These are farmers that will definitely um, have great stories to tell in the next couple of months. Lovely. Thanks, Noni. Yes, I have to agree with you. I think some of the most exciting businesses in, uh, in our pool, in our programs are in fact the women, the women owned businesses. And I always say to them, so when they say, no, they want to be the best woman-owned business in Limpopo, I say, why limit yourself? Be the best business, be the best uh, farmer. <laughs> so yeah, lo lovely, up, up for the women there, great. Um, Kuni, <laughs> uh, so really just a question um, today uh, to you. Uh, township business, I mean, I know that we, you've said um, in the previous conversation that localization is really important, creating local jobs, uh, creating circular economies in, you know, in South Africa, making money, money circulate in order to build wealth. How important is the township strategy uh, to you for that? Uh, Catherine, township and rural businesses are very, very important to us. Um, we are on a drive with the Department of Small Business Development and CIFA uh, on, on our plans to build on uh, uh, township businesses and rural uh, businesses. We believe that uh, the next growth point, you know, is, is really lying within the townships as well as in, in the rural areas. This is where we believe that uh, the growth trajectory is gonna start and it's gonna change the landscape of businesses in the country. Uh, a lot of times business have been concentrated in the urban areas uh, and in the cities and so on, uh, but there is good potential 
to encourage uh, business in the rural areas as well as in the townships because uh, there are a number of young people in the townships and in rural areas who can't find their way into the cities. So they want to make their own thing and do their businesses where they are based in the rural areas and in townships. And they can grow that economy. And in growing that economy, we then have to focus on how we can bring those products that they are manufacturing to clients and 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 uh, uh, customers within uh, the urban areas and the cities and so on. So our our drive into looking at rural economies and and and, and townships is is getting stronger and stronger. And government is refocusing to ensure that those businesses in the rural areas and in in, in the townships are given the necessary support that they deserve in order for them to grow into the next level where they will really uh, change the status quo of this country. And this can happen. We just need to believe in what we are doing. And But what's important is as CEDA and uh, 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 the Small Business Department and CIFA, we can't do it by ourselves. Hence, we are looking at the ecosystem. And within the ecosystem, we are saying, how do we then position ourselves, but also bringing in uh, the fourth industrial revolution to assist in this whole process and ensuring that this becomes a seamless process that will eventually ensure that all those people that are left behind in townships and, and in the rural areas are forming part of this economy and we can make this economy thrive and Fantastic. we can create the jobs that we want. Fantastic. Thanks, Kuni. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just want to take that forward, really, uh, Charles. I mean, it distill very much a rural, uh, rural business um, uh, ecosystem. I'm a real believer that one job or in, in a rural environment has even more impact than that same job in the, in the towns. Um, so I think the work that you're doing in the rural areas is so critical. Do you believe that, that we have the resources in order to become globally competitive as a, as a kind of rural farming community? Catherine, we certainly do. The resources are available. The intellectual capital is available. The desire and the commitment to want to achieve that is there. And we have seen that with particularly the farmers that we have been engaging. There is an absolute commitment to want to achieve that. The problem is just mobilizing it all at the time when it's needed. And there's something seems to be going wrong in the country. So you're finding that um, the style we might give the 25 million rand to one farmer in particular, but actually there are probably 30 or 40 farmers who require the same amount of funding to achieve the, the same kind of impact or even greater impact collectively. The markets are there. Um, the demand is there. The challenge, though, is to just, as I said earlier, to be able to mobilize all the kind of stakeholders that we need that can collectively go and make it happen. And I think that's probably where the big challenge is sitting at a national level at the moment. Because if you look at some of the um, black farmers that we have supported in the most remote parts of the province, uh, in the Western Cape in particular, the technology that is being applied is world-class. The outcomes that are being achieved is world-class but we need to scale it up now. And that's where the challenge is really lying. Lovely, thanks Charles. Yeah, I must say I hadn't really, um, hadn't really thought about it until this, this discussion that in, this, in your sector, both for you and Distel and with SAB, is the amounts of money that are needed in order to grow a, a small supplier so, so huge. It's not just mm -hmm. like somebody making widgets or beads or whatever, you know. Yeah, they're really, they're high capital intensive businesses, a lot of them. And so really finding ways to unlock proper amounts of money uh, uh, in order to invest in your industries becomes so important. So mm -hmm. that's great. I mean, I think that what I'd like is maybe just to do a quick roundup and, uh, and really ask you, um, ask each of you, uh, what is it that most excites you about uh, about supply development at, at this time? What what is the kind of one nugget that you want to leave us with? What's exciting? What's coming up? And uh, yeah, give 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 a message to us uh, of of some of, of kind of positivity because you're all doing incredible work. Uh, maybe just share. Maybe starting with you, Kuni. Uh, you know, what is the kind of last message that we can go out with? 
uh, that we can be really feel really positive about the way that we move forward. Uh, Catherine, I think um, when we look at supplier development and 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 the processes that we as CEDA are undertaking, um, we need to understand um, what the the needs of the clients are for our for, 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 for our suppliers. And that is determined by the diagnostic assessments that we do. And these diagnostic assessments that we do give us a broader picture of what is uh in it for both parties and ourselves as the facilitators. So supplier development is very, very important. We need to understand what are the requirements. We need to understand where the gaps are. We need to understand what is the time frame that we have in order for us to ensure that the delivery is happening at the right time, as I mentioned earlier, and at the right quality and also at the right price. Once we do that, the suppliers, will be able to be geared by all the assessments and developments that we, we are doing, but also on the assessment, we will then be able to identify the shortfalls, the shortcomings, and we gear them and develop them accordingly in order to meet the requirements of their clients. And if they meet the requirement of their clients, then the process becomes easier because they will then have happy clients. If they have happy clients, they are as suppliers will be happy. We as the development practitioners will be happy and the economy will then get the benefits thereof. Fantastic. So I'm looking there, Kuni, uh, excited about the fact that uh, CEDA is working so hard on creating this ecosystem and, uh, and, and really helping, helping people to identify where they can go for help so that, uh, so that as an industry, we can really be efficient and effective. Thank you. Looking forward to that. Thank you, Kuni. So Noni Kobashiana. Um, any last word that you'd like to say about what's exciting, what do you see as uh, exciting coming forward that, that, that people can feel good about in, in, in this supply development space? Um, for us as SAB, I guess it's, uh, it's partnerships. Um, so SAB together with BUSA, BLSA, Manufacturing Circle, Pride South African, as well as NDI, have been nominated as local procurement advocates, right? We report against the job summit deliverables and we have formed a technical working committee to implement a corporate centered localization approach. And our request to corporate South Africa is basically to review their procurement practices and to give preferences to companies that are manufacturing locally as well as to earmark procurement opportunities for these companies. Um, and a key vehicle that would be used to actually track these localization efforts is the market access platform. And now what we've done is we've also partnered with Proudly South African to expand the platform and look at localization. So this is something that is very dear to our hearts. Um, the call for, for, for call to action was actually launched two weeks ago, and we've received overwhelming support uh, from Corpus of Africa um, to asking us how can they participate in this initiative. Um, and we are looking forward to actually reporting back in October in terms of what Corpus of Africa has actually done when it comes to localization, specifically going back to government as well as labor. Um, so this is something very exciting that we have been part of since March of this year, and we're looking forward to establishing more partnerships and collaboration with other parties um, so we can actually uh, move the needle. That sounds very exciting indeed. That's excellent. So, I mean, really calling, calling on people to support local and uh, really putting, it sounds like you're putting the vehicle in place to make sure that that can happen. That's exciting. Please keep us informed. Really look Definitely. forward to seeing how that, that rolls out. Excellent. Thank you. So, yeah, over to you then. Uh, you get the last word, Charles. It's over to you to give us, a, tell us whatever you want. We can't, I, I can't even press mute on your mic. So, yeah, please, please uh, take it away. Thanks, Catherine. I think, well, Distel is also a signatory to the Job Summit um, commitments, as well as the CEO's forum that Noni was referring to. And certainly there, our approach at the moment is fully around partnerships, because that's how we can leverage each other's capacities and resources to really scale up that what we individually are trying to achieve. And you really get that synergy developing around one plus one equaling three. But for me, the thing that's really exciting about supplier development um, is when we look at some of our suppliers that were struggling or are struggling at the moment, but we start seeing them really making those big changes. 
Um, because during this time now and building of resilience, it's that three things that all of them have to do. Show strong leadership. Uh, the, the company CEOs need to show strong leadership in understanding what's going on inside the companies. Then, of course, knowing their operating environment or the work environment really well. And then being developing the ability um, to adapt and respond to the changes that's busy taking place. And when you look at one of your suppliers and they tell you, guess what, I've just secured a, um, a 5 million rand contract for this year with, an, with one of our competitors, they're not saying fantastic. I mean, he has now moved beyond just distill as a client and he secured a con company, a, a contract with company X or company Y, broadening his supplier, but his, his client base and increasing his um, demand for products, which means that the profitability of that company is now being increased. And that's when you say, you know what, it's all worth the, the, the blood and sweat that us as the uh, supporters of programs are investing um, to see that kind of return happening. And when we see the partnerships paying off. So absolutely something that is uh, of great value to the entire country, Catherine. And I think it's something all of us should continue to support and be committed to. Uh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Charles. And what I love about this, uh, your last words and all, 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 four, all three of you, is that really this is why the Supply Developments uh, were, uh, Awards were set up. Um, it's really to, to acknowledge best practice, and you certainly have, uh, have shown that. But it's also to, to, share, to, to share stories, to, to share learnings, and to create this ecosystem so that we collectively can use supply development in order to build long-term competitive advantage, not just for, for the corporates that you represent, but also for the, uh, for the suppliers and for the, for the country as a whole. So thank you. I think that you've really embodied in, in that closing statement exactly what the, the ABSA Business Day Supply Development Awards are all about. So I'd like to thank you all, Kunik Slabat, Noni, Kovishiana, and uh, Charles, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a fantastic uh, session. I've loved it. Um, just a reminder that this is really a lead up to the actual awards and the awards uh, ceremony and the awards announcement will take place next week on the 7th of September. So uh, yeah, thank you so much, everybody. And thanks for joining. Uh, we're, we're, yeah, it's been a great day. Thank you, I've enjoyed it. <laughs>